quero saudar a todos os nossos ouvintes e, e, e pessoal que nos assiste no, no Nota de Rodapé aqui no YouTube. Hoje, dando é, continuidade ao nosso projeto Interlocuções, nós temos um convidado, como, como de praxe, sempre muito especial. Ele é um historiador americano que trata de história cultural, história do livro, e é um especialista da França no século XVIII. É professor em Harvard e foi diretor da, univers... é, da biblioteca da mesma universidade entre 2007 e 2016. Hoje a gente tem o prazer de conversar com o professor Robert Darton. E para entrevistá-lo, nós temos é, o professor André Araújo, professor Luiz Felipe Silvério Lima e a Verônica Calçone, que vocês já viram aqui em algumas outras entrevistas. E eu, Jonathan Portela, que apresenta esse programa, é, vamos conversar com o, o professor. So, well, Professor Darton, thank you for accepting our invitation. It's a great honor having you here in our show. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to have a conversation with you. Yeah. You, you have been in Brazil a couple of times, right? I've been there five times and loved it each time. I feel a lot, a lot of sympathy for Brazil, uh, for my publisher, uh, yes, you know, uh, Companhia das Letras, And in general, for Brazilians, you've got such a wonderful, warm population, and yet you're going through terrible difficulty. So I really send my sympathy and solidarity. Thanks, Professor. Thanks. Uh, at, before we start the questions about your, your work, there is a question that I, I, I want to, to, to run. Uh, are there any Brazilian historians that you like to read, that you admire the work? Well, you know, uh, I'm a good friend of Lili Schwartz um, yeah. and her husband. Uh, Luis is my publisher. I'm very fond of them. But Lili, as a historian, is fabulous. I have, however, a handicap. I don't read Portuguese. I kind of read it through Spanish and through Italian, So I can get the general idea, but to read full-scale books in Portuguese is beyond me. All right, Professor. Well, uh, I'm going to start this interview by, by talking about one of your main works, uh, The Great Cat, uh, Cat Massacre. More specifically, the, methodol uh, the methodological proposals that, that take a refuge in anthropology and the influence of Professor Clifford Gertz even though this is a, a historiographical work. So in the, right in the introduction uh, to the book, you claim, and I quote you, uh, this book grew out of a course, History 406, that I have offered at Princeton University since 1972. Originally an introduction to the history of mentalities, the course developed into a seminar on history and anthropology, thanks to the influence of Clifford Gertz, who has taught the course with me for the last six years, and in doing so has taught me most of, of what I know about anthropology. A few pages later, still in introduction, you anticipate uh, uh, possible criticisms because of its influence. And I quote you again, I realize there are risks in departing from the established modes of history. Some will object that the evidence is too vague for one ever to penetrate into minds of peasants who disappeared two centuries ago. Others will take offense as the, at the idea of interpreting a massacre of cats in the same vein as the discourse preliminaire for, of the encyclopedia, or interpreting it at all. And still more readers will recoil at the arbitrariness, arbitrariness of selecting a few strange documents as point of entry into 18th century through rather than proceeding in a, systema a systematic manner through the canon of classic texts. I think there are valid replies to those objections, but I do not want to turn this introduction into a discourse on methods. Well, you were right about the criticism <laughs> you, rece <laughs> you received then. Uh -huh. Some historians, uh, such as uh, Giovanni Levi, highlighted uh, what, in their view, would be a methodological problem, both for anthropology itself and for the specific influence of Gertz. Now, almost 40 years after the publication of the first edition, 
how do you see these criticisms and how do you see the evolution of the dialogues between cultural history and anthropology since then? And does thinking about anthropology just through Gert's filter end up limiting all anthropolo uh, anthropological science since we are talking about one author, one point of view, one current of thought? Well, I should begin by explaining that when I first came into contact with the Annal School of Historians in Paris, everyone was excited about what they called history of mentalities, histoire des mentalités. The idea was to try to get in, inside a way of thinking of ordinary people, not just formal philosophers. And this was done primarily through statistical study, through consulting so-called popular literature, uh, like the Bibliothèque Bleu, uh, and uh, studying even uh, wills, as, as Michel Vauvel did, trying to understand people's vision of death, the afterlife, religious basic attitudes. No one today talks about histoire des mentalités. I think that's disappeared as a kind of historical method, if you want to call it that. But now in Paris, it's been replaced by history and anthropology. People use expressions in French like l'imaginaire social, the social imaginary, without hesitation. So I think there has been a shift in general to an anthropological approach to historical study. Now, the, what about the objections to that? I should explain first that although I was a close friend of Clifford Gertz and we taught a seminar on history and anthropology for, off and on for 20 years, uh, the book was not based exclusively on Gertz's view of anthropology. There are lots of other anthropologists that I studied and admired. Um, in a way, uh, the greatest of them was E. E. Evans Pritchard. I don't know if he's very familiar to Brazilian readers. I think he was a great anthropologist, very inspiring for historians. And there were many others, such as Victor Turner, whose view of symbolism and ritual was crucial to the Great Cat Massacre, and Mary Douglas, I think a wonderful uh, anthropologist. So what, I'm, what I was attempting to do was not in some mechanical way to apply Goethe's theory, but rather to take a general approach in which we study symbols and take the symbolic world of ordinary people seriously. Everyone, I think, lives in a symbolic world. We use symbols to make sense of life. Uh, it seems to me that human beings uh, crave for meaning and meaningfulness is as important as food and drink for the human condition. So it really does exist just as language exists, even though we each speak in different ways. The challenge, I think, for the historian of, let's call it cultural history in a broad sense of the word, the challenge is to penetrate into a mode of thinking that is different from our own. So I find that often when I come across something unexpected, strange, opaque, something that makes me think I'm not getting an aspect of this cultural system, that's a point of entry into analyzing the otherness of other people's thoughts. The Great Cat Massacre was like that. Uh, most of us think of cats as pets and so on. The notion of domestic pets was very foreign 200, 300 years ago. And in fact, um, to torture and ritually kill cats was not it was funny. So I think of trying to get a joke to understand the humor behind this ritual massacre is a way of getting into another culture. All right. And 
that that's pretty curious that you use the word mechanical because that's exactly the word that that Professor uh, Giovanni Levi used to to uh, to critics this uh, this work. Have you ever had the opportunity to talk to Giovanni Levi or another historian about this uh, this methodological uh, issues? Well, not with him specifically. I'd love to do so, but. Um, of course, I've been challenged about the Great Cat Massacre, and there's a quite a large literature about that specifically. So yes, I've been trying. I've uh, I think answered a lot of my critics. I wrote an article about the symbolic element in cultural history, and in general, uh, I use the argument that. I think was beautifully developed by Victor Turner in a book called The Forest of Symbols. What Turner explains is that symbols aren't just uh, a direct representation of something else, that there is no mechanical link between the symbolic expression and the attitude, but rather symbols are multivocal. They can get across many different things at the same time, just as a statement in a poem or any statement can. Meaning, in other words, is complex. And it's, I think, even simple-minded to expect that cats simply symbolize one thing, such as sexuality. Uh, they symbolize many things to people, and that can be demonstrated I think, empirically. So it's a feasible task. It can be done. And it seems to me historical research involves re getting into a symbolic world, but documenting it, having the evidence. And that I hope I could do in the Great Cat Massacre, whereas my critics expected that symbols are some kind of, you know, like a, a mechanical have a mechanical connection that can be decoded in some absolute way. No, they're fluid. They're parts of rituals. Uh, they can be interpreted in various ways, but they have a set of meanings that actually, I think, can be recovered by the historian. All right, Professor. Thank you for the answer. Uh, André, for favor. Hi, everybody. It's a great pleasure uh, for me to be here. I'm André de Melo Araújo. I'm professor for early modern history at the University of Brasilia in Brazil. And my recent research is very much connected to the history of the book. That's the reason why it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you, especially with you, Professor Darton. Um, I'd like to move the topic of our conversation to archiving politics. And um, in 2010, the Library of the Congress announced that would, it would comprehensively collect every single tweet published on Twitter. This announcement is part of an ambitious project with a, which aims at preserving digital records. But on December 2017, the library published in its blog an update on its Twitter archive. The library say it begins archiving tweets for the same reason it collects other materials, but since the volume of tweets has increased dramatically since 2010, it announced that it will no longer archive every single tweet. This move is explained as follows. Tweets are now often more visual than textual, limiting the value of text only collecting. In your recent work, Professor Darton, you are very much concerned not only about texts that were written in the past, especially in the 18th century, but also about the sound of the past. You have said in an interview that sound is something that's very difficult for historians to grasp. And this leads me to two questions. First, how do you evaluate the hierarchy that libraries and archives eventually make when choosing what kind of material should be collected and therefore preserved? And second, in your opinion, what's now not being collected today so that historians in the future will say in 200 or 300 years, that's an aspect of the 21st century history that's difficult to grasp. Ah, well, thank you for a very interesting and challenging question. Um, one thing that most librarians would agree about is 
the failure of libraries to collect ephemera from the past. The focus had been traditionally on books and frequently on books by famous writers. It coincided with what I call the great man, great book view of history. Well, now we have women who are central to historical study and the very notion of a canon of classics has been challenged and exploded. So we've discovered that we failed to collect um, things such as not merely pamphlets, but graffiti and images. Uh, we haven't paid attention to advertisements in journals as well as the journals themselves. Collecting is a very complicated business and having been the head of a very large library, I appreciate the problems. Some of them are financial. I think the Library of Congress simply could not afford to collect and curate uh, all tweets, so it gave up. That doesn't mean the tweets are unimportant, but there are limits of the possible. Now, in my case, uh, as to my historical research, you're absolutely right. It seems to me that we need to be able to hear the past, not just to look at what it has left in the form of documents. And I came to this not because of the perhaps obvious point that uh, talk, oral communication is important, but because I, by good luck, stumbled upon a dossier while doing research in the Bibliothèque de l'Arsenal in Paris. It was called The Affair of the Fourteen, L'Affaire des Quatorze. And I was looking for something else, but I've learned that often you find the most interesting things when you're not looking for them, but you come upon them by mistake. So I opened the dossier, and what did I find? Well, it was a detective story, a police uh, investigation into uh, a poem. Uh, they, gave, they had only the first line of the poem, and their assignment, which came from the top of the government in Versailles, was to find its author. They had lots of police spies. Finally, one spy reported that he had found someone who had recited the poem. That person was arrested. He confessed and said he got the poem from another person who was arrested, made a confession, and so on, until the French had filled the Bastille with 14 very talkative uh, prisoners. Uh, it was possible then to trace not just one poem that was recited orally, but a whole series of poems from one person to another with exact precision because the police detectives did a good job. And my job as a historian detective was to follow the trail. It became clear, in other words, that Oral transmission was, at least in this case, something that could be followed by historical research. And then what really intrigued me was that many of these poems were set to music. And it turned out that Parisians around 1750 were every day improvising new words to old tunes. The tunes were easy to Everyone knew them. They were easy to use for a new message. Um, and in the archives, I would find uh, the actual texts of the messages, that is to say a text of a song with the title sung to the tune of, and then I would get the name of a tune that I'd never heard of, of course, like La Béquille du Père Baraba. I mean, <coughs> no one had ever, no one knows that tune today. However, it turned out that in the musicology department of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, uh, there's a key to tunes. So you can look up the title of a tune or the first line, the title of a, of a tune, and uh, you can get the actual musical annotation. 
Well, a friend of mine, Hélène de Laveau, is a, a cabaret singer in Paris, and she agreed to actually sing the tunes according to the actual music that I could identify. Uh, so the book uh, called, uh, in, in English, it's called Poetry and the Police. In French, it's La Fère des Quatorze. The book has an online recording that you, the reader, can listen to when you see the text of the, of the poems. So it's as if you can hear the past. Now, of course, you can't hear it perfectly. Uh, Hélène de Laveau, in singing, interprets the tunes. However, it, it's a very different experience to listen to the power of the music or the jokes, the references. It's, it's something quite extraordinary. In fact, she and I have been going around g giving what we call lecture cabarets in which I will explain the political background of the songs and then she sings them. I interrupt her, she interrupts me. And you have a kind of dialogue in which you're getting at this, this element of the past that has escaped most historical researchers, oral transmission. It is possible. You need good luck. You need the archives. But it's something of crucial importance and I think uh, today in libraries, we need uh, not only collections of oral exchanges, but of visual exchanges, of videos of the kind of thing you and I are doing right now. Thank you very much. I hope that your book is going to be preserved in the future, but also the tunes that have been made especially for that <laughs> book. Yes. You know, if I could explain a little bit, I then spent months and months studying tunes because there are large collections called chansonniers in several different French libraries. And I made a list of the tunes that appeared most often in the manuscript collections of the texts. Uh, and I really am convinced that uh, Parisians around 1750 shared a repertory of common tunes. Uh, that there were maybe 20 tunes that everyone knew. And it was extremely easy to take some recent event and to fit it into the tune. Well, I'm sure you have a repertory of tunes in your head. I do. Many of mine, I'm afraid, are from advertisements I heard on the radio in the 1950s. And I can't get rid of them. Uh, but I've heard uh, parodies of them that sometimes were political. Uh, so this is a force. And uh, I'm convinced that Paris in the middle of the 18th century was full of people singing. There were beggars who sang. There were professional chansonneurs uh, on every street corner. And people would sing at work. Uh, so the air of Paris was full of songs. And the songs were vehicles of political information. They were newspapers at a time when real newspapers did not exist. No, thank you very much. Philippe, your turn. Hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, I'm very happy to be here and talking with Professor Darton with my colleagues uh, uh, and former students. Uh, 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 and uh, I'm, uh, it's an honor to, to be talking to you. I'm uh, Luis Felipe Silvero Lima. I'm professor of early modern history at UNIFESP, Federal University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, and I'm uh, studying, researching for a long time, uh, not specifically uh, book history, but uh, I'm uh, cultural history and sometimes print history and, 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 and trying to understand this phenomenon of millenarianism in, in, in this perspective. Uh, uh, I am uh, use your uh, uh, books and articles in my uh, classes, uh, uh, and uh, well, my question uh, will uh, uh, continue on the topic of, of uh, news and, and uh, the possibility of, of having, uh, uh, just a second here, yeah, uh, of having a, a of understanding how news circulated in, in 18th century. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to 
uh, uh, understand and I, I, what I try to 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 explain uh, try, try to explain to my students is that uh, 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 as you show in your uh, George Washington uh, false teeth uh, uh, is that uh, the uh, way that news circulated at the time is uh, for us in theory should be completely different so that that was the goal of of of, of reading and discussing uh, 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 the chapter of that book. Uh, but the, 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 the interesting thing is that, I don't know, in the, in the last two or three years, uh, uh, students, uh, my students uh, start to talk uh, and ask, ask me, but uh, 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 Professor, you're saying that's different, but we are living uh, the same experience now. So there is uh, the, the way uh, information uh, 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 goes around the way people uh, 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 take uh, uh, for granted some some things the way of uh, how people get informed by some things it's very similar that the way that the, the guy diagram uh, you showed uh, you you built in, uh, in in that chapter so what i'm uh, uh, asking what i'm interested in, in hearing you uh, uh, talking about is uh, about how you think uh, first to explain a little bit more, further the argument that you presented at, at, at that book and thinking this uh, uh, intersection between oral communication, uh, between tombs, uh, uh, between print, uh, between manuscript, written, short uh, 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 notations and things like that, that create a way of, uh, a path of knowledge, a way of knowing things and spreading information but also how uh, uh, you are uh, uh, thinking, how you're uh, uh, seeing uh, nowadays the same problem that, uh, or a, si a similar phenomenon that uh, uh, as we are living now with fake news, with uh, 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 media outlets that are not properly media outlets, they are more like a, a, a kind of uh, a gossip columns uh, uh, in a travesty of, a, a, a newspaper or a news blog or things like that, and yeah. uh, uh, that that's the that's the kind of uh, 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 problem uh, uh, I start to th uh, to to face when uh, using your text in the the recent uh, in the past years. So uh, uh, that that's the, the, there are two questions in it. Thank you. Well, thank you. The very interesting questions. It sounds as though you have extremely intelligent and astute students. Uh, having met some Brazilian students also at Sao Paulo, I can appreciate that. Uh, I'll give you an example from the 18th century and try to compare it with the present. Of course, in um, the 18th century, uh, you did not in France have real newspapers, that is newspapers with news in it about public affairs. Yes, there were periodicals, but it's not until the French Revolution that you get a real important local press. So how did you find out what was happening? Well, one way you found things out was to go to a tree in the garden of the Palais Royal, the so-called tree of Krakow. By custom, people who wanted to know what was really happening would just show up at this tree a crowd would gather around it and they would exchange information orally. They were called nouvelles de bouche, mouth, news by word of mouth. Some of them would then write little scraps of paper and exchange them at cafes. So you pick out of your pocket a piece of paper. I give it to you, you give one to me. Little bits of paper are circulating with handwritten notices on them. And later on, some of these notices are combined in a kind of uh, running narrative in a manuscript gazette and later a printed gazette. So we can reconstruct this process. Now, one place that this happened every day was a salon called the Salon of Madame Doublé. It had a nickname called La Paroisse, the parish. Every day uh, in the morning, Madame Doublé would send a servant out to servant quarters in the Marais district of Paris 
And the servant would come up with gossip passed around by other servants. He would write the gossip into one uh, into two registers, large books, open books. One was a register of news that was probably true. The other, a register of news that was probably false, just gossip. And these two registers would be available to people later in the day when they arrived to discuss news, because this was a salon dedicated to news. They would add in their own handwriting information that they got of both kinds. And later, the uh, register with reliable, supposedly reliable news would be copied out by another servant. The copies would be sent to different places and copies would be made of the copies. Eventually it was published. So there was a distinction between fake news and real news, even in the 18th century. Now, of course, today we hear about nothing but fake news. And it's very interesting because before in the United States, the presidency of Trump, you didn't hear about that at all. It was a system of professionals, people who were trained to cover events. What is it to cover an event? Well, I used to be a newspaper reporter myself, and my editor would say to me, uh, there's a report of a fire at so such and such an address in Manhattan, you cover it. So I would go there, I would look at the fire, I would interview the fire chief, I would try to smell and get the sense of the atmosphere, come back, tell the editor what had happened. And he would say to me, 500 words, or maybe 800 words. Uh, and I would have to reduce my impressions to a narrative. So news, I believe, is a form of storytelling. It does involve a narrative, but it's done, it was done by professionals who had acquired a skill and had been socialized in the uh, business of trying to get across events. That professional world um, still exists, but it's under challenge because not just Trump, but uh, the whole right-wing populist element in the United States has attacked the press as so-called fake news and the respect for reporters and editors as professionals who are trying to do their job has uh, disappeared. So I think we've got a, a new world actually, and your students are quite right to emphasize this, a world in which there is no sense of solidity in uh, accounts of events, but rather a kind of fluid world in which everything you hear is suspect. And therefore, often you filter out things that you don't want to hear because they don't correspond to your own views. It's uh, what we call the silo effect. You know, a silo mm -hmm. is a structure in which things are contained and can't get out. So people in this world in which communication is easy, as between you in Sao Paulo and me in Massachusetts, this world far from being open and mm -hmm. uh, viable is a world in which people are becoming more closed. That, I think, is a real danger for democracy, and we're suffering from it at this moment. So I think your students probably put their fingers on something very important. Thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, my connection here uh, froze for uh, just a second, so I, I don't know if I uh, uh, hear everything, heard everything. So uh, 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 what, what I, I want to, to, to address uh, further is that, uh, 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 so uh, uh, what are you saying, uh, and I, I, I'm glad that, that you mentioned your, your former experience as, as a journalist, because this is, uh, this is part of, of the the interesting, uh, one of the interesting aspects of your experience, a personal experience as journalist, uh, producing news and a historian that is interested in uh, 
uh, uh, researching news in the past. So you, you can uh, uh, understand the process from within and can, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, relate to uh, the, the limits of, of it, uh, especially uh, in, in our current circumstances, uh, 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 political circumstances. Uh, uh, but the, the point is, uh, uh, what you're seeing in a way is that uh, from 18th century perspective, uh, 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 our fake news uh, 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 wouldn't be uh, accepted as uh, news uh, uh, in a way. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, this uh, 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 make me think about in which sense we are talking about uh, uh, nowadays uh, in a, uh, uh, as you put it in the, the they did it were actually in a closed circuit uh, uh, of communication and a dangerous, uh, and there, there is a very dangerous uh, uh, perspective on it. Uh, uh, in, in which, uh, how do you say uh, uh, if, uh, what do you think about not having actually nowadays what uh, uh, we think it's a kind of uh, uh, public sphere uh, 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 in this sense, the. 18th century idea of public sphere uh, is uh, uh, is still uh, exist uh, exists today or not? Well, you know, uh, I haven't come across the actual word public sphere in reading documents from the 18th century, but the idea, yes. And usually there's a general expression about public opinion, but also public places, lieu public. For example, the market, uh, the Maubert marketplace, um, the Palais Royal, the uh, Quai des Augustins, the Place Dauphine, the Pont Neuf. I mean, I could cite many parts of Paris that were considered open spaces where people talked. And in, we even have accounts of that talk uh, by uh, Louis Sébastien Mercier, one of the most interesting writers of this time. He wrote a book called um, Les Entretiens du Palais Royal, the talk in the Palais Royal, and the talk in the Luxembourg Gardens, in which he, he communicates how people talked in public spaces. So yes, there certainly was something you could call a public sphere. There were lots of debates. Uh, it was very fluid. And uh, I think it was absolutely crucial in certain moments, uh, moments when uh, there was a crisis, when the government wasn't really in control of the course of events, and when the appeal to public opinion was crucial. As I could give you examples, but you know, I don't want to turn this into a long history uh, lecture at all. Still, um, there was <coughs> the, a growing force, which people called public opinion, that really did have an influence on events. Now, is your question, how do we compare this with things today? Um, well, I think um, it, it, f take a spectacular incident, such as the 9-11 attack on the World Trade Towers. I think that everyone in the United States and many people in the rest of the world knew, knows today exactly where they were when 9-11 happened. And we can see it in our memory. Um, what I think occurred in 9-11 was not just the catastrophic destruction of those buildings and many deaths, but also a sense of a public, of the whole nation coming together in the traumatic experience of a great event. Well, things like that do happen. And when they happen, you get, I think, the development of what I would call collective consciousness. So aside from the problem of fake news versus real news, of gossip versus uh, solid facts, aside from that, there's another dimension that I think has not been adequately understood. In fact, that's what I'm writing about in the, my current 
book which I'm drafting at the moment, namely Collective Consciousness. Now, you might say, sounds good, but how can you actually demonstrate it? Um, well, I think that's the challenge, to show not simply that it existed, but what it expressed. Um, so I think, in fact, the French Revolution was like 9-11 repeated over and over again, uh, a, um, a spectacular event that touched everyone in society. People reacted in different ways. They had different opinions. They often were fundamentally opposed, but they shared a consciousness of what was going on. And so I think an account of what was going on is, in fact, possible. Uh, and that's what I'm I'm trying to discuss now. It's I'm I'm not exactly answering your question, but deviating into a different line of thought. But I think that line of thought is something your students might actually pursue. Is there a con collective consciousness in Brazil? How can one know what it is? What sorts of evidence do you use in trying to demonstrate its effectiveness? Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so for the last question of this round, Veronica. Oh, hello, Professor. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I read lots of your works. Um, they were very special to me because I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Sao Paulo, and I'm currently studying early modern English books and pamphlets, mainly ephemera, and how they were produced and um, they were circulating in the 17th century. So uh, it's always interesting to be able to attend a conversation like this. Well, my first question uh, is related to some of the activities that you developed, both as a historian as, and also as a librarian, I guess. You have participated in many projects concerning the internet and digital sources, uh, such as digitization of books and documents, the construction of databases and online resources, such as the Electronic Enlightenment and also Gutenberg E. So considering all of this experience, I would like to ask you two things. The first one is, how do you understand uh, the impact of these technologies on the work of historians? And in a more particular perspective, how do you understand uh, the impacts of these technologies on the work of book historians or bibliographers, because the digital copy changes a lot <laughs> uh, the perspective that you, we have when we are trying to analyze uh, the materiality of a book. Yes. Well, as you know from your own study of pamphlets and books in 17th century England, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, there is a wonderful uh, tactile quality to uh, books, pamphlets that are 300 years old or older, uh, the experience of reading them is quite different. In fact, uh, I, I'm convinced that readers in the 17th and 18th centuries looked at the material substratum of literature just as they looked at the words. In other words, they looked at the paper. And if you uh, study advertisements for books, one thing that I find fascinating is that they will say, paint printed on the best paper from Auvergne, uh, printed on excellent paper. And there was a whole vocabulary for qualities of paper because consumers cared about it. When you study the way paper was actually made, a very complicated and difficult process, sheet by sheet, done by hand, you can understand that. So, of course, I'm with you. The study of old books and pamphlets uh, is a way of getting in contact with the experience of readers as they held the physical object in their hands. And we can't reproduce that experience by electronic transmission and digitization. What we can do is something different. Namely, we can, uh, first of all, get at least the text, make the text available uh, across uh, various uh, enormous distances. So I'm constantly using Gallica in, from the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, and I can read uh, pamphlets from the 18th century that normally 
uh, were impossible to read before the digital age. You would have to go to Paris. Well, it's great fun to go to Paris, uh, but not everyone can do it. And as, as aside from sheer avail avail availability, we have um, mass data and word searches and all kinds of techniques that can be used in order to uh, have a different perspective on uh, the printed word uh, from the past. Now, I'm a little bit skeptical about um, the effects of uh, mass digitization. I I'm in favor of it. I created my own website. I helped to edit a series of digital books. Uh, of course, it's important. But what has actually resulted from big data that has changed our ideas about the past? Not so much. I mean, so far, I have a slight sense of disappointment because I was hoping we would enter a new world. Uh, we're in a new world of communication, but f as far as historical research is concerned, I think the hard results are rather limited. Um, now, uh, not for the research, not for getting at the documents, but I mean the actual conclusions. So I'm not giving a clear and crisp answer to your question. I'm trying to say, on the one hand, um, the digital era has opened up enormous possibilities. But on the other hand, uh, I think there's room for skepticism as to how much it's actually transformed our understanding. Thank you, Professor. Uh, but also, do you think it changed something on the way that historians do their work, the way we approach documents and the way that we read them right now, or how uh, actually how the researches are being conducted in this moment? Because as we can access more documents, we can have the opportunity to, to be more specific and to know everything about a single subject but we are losing lots of context, I guess. So I would like to know also, what do you think about this kind of methodological impact? Well, uh, personally, I think like you, I believe context is, is crucial. So we want to recreate, reconstruct context in all of its richness. And that can mean um, recreating a discourse as some of the uh, historians in Cambridge University would insist, but also um, getting at the way the, the surrounding atmosphere of a reader. There you are in Sao Paulo, but you can, from your computer, get at English pamphlets from the 17th century. You don't have to travel to London. That's extraordinary. It means democratization in the access to knowledge. And that, for me, is actually the most important part of the digital era. We can now make available virtually the entirety of the uh, books that existed in the past, up to a certain point. And that point in the United States is actually, believe it or not, 1932. Because copyright laws are so extensive that they keep out of the public domain virtually every book published since 1932. That's most 20th century literature, never mind the 21st century. So uh, yes, things have opened up, but also the public domain has not been opened up the way it should. And that's something that goes along with the digital era. So in a way, I see two tendencies. It sounds maybe over simple, but one is democratization and the other is commercialization. It seems to me that there is a stranglehold on the availability of books, not just by publishers, um, but by vested interests, such as Hollywood. It's such as Google. Uh, Google, I think, tried to acquire a monopoly of access to knowledge in digital form. 
And myself, I got very involved in the attempt to prevent that monopoly. Fortunately, a court in New York said that Google book search, as it was called, was a violation of laws against monopoly. So Google was stopped in its tracks and we have, we have created another library, the Digital Public Library of America, which makes all books available free to everyone, including everyone in Brazil. However, we cannot make available books covered by copyright. We need to change the copyright laws. The public has an interest in this change. So although I'm an author myself, I'm all for authors rights and for protecting authors and helping people who live by their pen or by their uh, keyboard, still, I think there should be limits and the public's interest has not been adequately uh, recognized. Thank you so much, Professor. Well, Professor Durkton, uh I will start the second round. And my next question actually is a, a, a collective construction that was born from some interlocutions between me, Veronica, and some colleagues from the University of Sao Paulo about your book, Sensors at Work, from, 2000, uh, in, uh, from 2014, right? Uh, I don't remember. I don't remember. I, I think something some like that. All right. Uh, in this book and, uh, and other reflections, you have presented different types of censorship, which oh, can yes. be yeah. of a religious, political, etc., that influence the indication and the res reception of a text. But uh, even when we are not talking about an autocratic regime, there are other types of constraints uh, that can restrict the circulation of a text. But in this sense, you do not see the publishing market as a censor. Uh, it, is, it is not possible to say that capitalism can exercise censorship in so far as publishers can pressure what should be pu published and what should not. And I can even send my text to an, uh, an independent publisher, but would, will it be read in, in the end isn't this a censoring practice? Like, doesn't editorial capitalism end up censoring a series of authors who either don't have the money to publish their works or are not considered good enough by the editors? Well, maybe, maybe I could challenge you by asking this question. Do you feel that all authors have a right to be published? Uh, I think so. I think so, especially now that, that we have uh, a virtual environment and many, many uh, uh, possibilities of, of reading. Why, why not? And I wasn't asking whether they should be published, but do they have a right to publication? The reason I put it that way is that... Uh, your, your question about the market as a form of censorship seems to imply that authors have a right to appear in print. I don't see it that way. I think that um, there is a right of freedom of speech, but I see publishing as an industry that is part of an economic system. Uh, and people, professionals who work within that industry, um, exercise judgment, have the capital to decide what will and what will not be published. And so, of course, there is a filtering process that excludes some people and includes others. And we have uh, many protests, certainly in the, in the United States, from Black writers and Black women writers who felt they were excluded by this process. So I, I take the argument seriously, but I really feel it's entirely different from authoritarian systems where the publication it process itself is controlled by the state. So I've read through um, you know dozens of books by people who were published 
in the Soviet world after World War II. And if you read them, not just Solzhenitsyn, but lots of others, you see that it was impossible to appear in print um, without making serious compromises. And when they had made so many compromises, they couldn't stand it. They either stopped writing or they left the country if they could escape. I, I followed this in detail in East Germany because as I um, explain in this book on censorship, I happened to be in Berlin for the entire year of the fall of the wall. And I got to know East German censors. Uh, in fact, I interviewed them and it was a fascinating experience because I had studied censorship in 18th century France. And there I was talking with real live censors. And I wasn't trying to criticize them. I was trying to understand them. How did you do your job was what I wanted to find out. Um, and it, in fact, our conversation began the, with the question you asked. I was sitting in the actual office of the censors in East Berlin, just after the fall of the wall. And they knew we had a common friends in the East German publishing industry. So they knew I was not on a witch hunt. Still, who was this person? What was this animal, an American, doing in their office? They'd never met an American before. They'd never set foot in West Germany. And here was an American in East Germany in their office asking questions about censorship. The conversation began when one of them said to me, you have censorship in your country, it's the marketplace. Exactly what you just said, and uh, Jonathan. I, um, I said, okay, I know that argument, but your censors, what, what is censorship to you? And then um, Herr Lübke was the name of the censor, answered with one word, planning. Literature should be planned like everything else in a socialist system. It's a matter of social engineering. And he then reached into a drawer and gave me a copy of the plan for literature in East Germany in the year uh, 1990, a year that never existed because East Germany collapsed. And I later studied it. It was fascinating. But the idea was you simply could not publish a book unless it became part of the plan. And the censors thought that they were social engineers contributing to the welfare of a good socialist society. I mean, they, they were not hypocrites. I think they were true believers in literature as a part of social engineering. Now, I see that, that, that notion of total state control of what appears in print as radically different from the functioning of editors and publishing houses in an open society where there is a choice of going to other publishers, even though it's very true that many people who want to publish will not publish. I should add, by the way, that self-publishing has now become a huge phenomenon in the US. I try to follow how many books are actually produced. And it's something, something like 330,000 new titles are produced each year in the US, maybe as high as 350,000. But the self-published books on the internet are more than 700,000, more than twice as many as books produced through the commercial trade process. So we're living in a world where the democratization of access to print as readers exists, but also as writers. It's fascinating. And I, the reason I insist on the distinction between an authoritarian state that controls all publishing as opposed to an open society is I think it matters. I think it's a difference between true freedom of speech and uh, uh, a kind of enslavement. So the trivialization of the notion of censorship is 
in my opinion, a danger. And I even connected it with some postmodern theory because some postmodern critics would say, everything you say, every gesture you make is filtered, is censored. So nothing is uncensored and censorship is everywhere. My reply is, if censorship is everywhere, it's nowhere. You're trivi trivializing the concept of censorship. And I think we should take seriously what we can learn about the way censorship operated in, in really authoritarian regimes. I appreciate, Professor, uh, your answer. Actually, this is not, not an answer uh, from my own. This is a, 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 a question from my own. It's a question from the little Marxist Jonathan that lives inside me somewhere. And he, <laughs> he really wanted to ask you that. <laughs> well, I've got the same person inside me. I know how you feel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So thanks, Professor. Uh, please, Professor Andrea. Okay, so I'd like to make um, a second question connecting some topics that we have already discussed it anyway. So um, to my first question, you answered something related to the ephemera that has not been thoroughly co collected. And um, I'd like to move my question from your books to your ephemera. So um, last December, you published a book review. It was a book review from... Andrew Pitgris and Arthur Devedouven's new book called The Bookshop of the World. And in this review, you say that, I will quote, we commonly think of books as containers of ideas or wrapping for literature, but can, they can be used in other ways, as if they were bloody cells carrying oxygen through a body politic or data points as infinite as the stars in the sky. Books lead lives of their own, and they intersect with our lives in ways we have only begun to understand. I think that's a very inspiring verbal image that leads me once more to two questions, especially when you say that books lead lives of their own. Um, and these questions are very much connected to methodological problems of writing something connected to the history of the book. I will pose the problem in a short sentence how to write a biography of a book. So how far can we ascribe an independent life to a book, especially when we are thinking about its material condition and its material production in a print shop? Not only thinking about authorship, but also connecting it to the very process that books came, come out to the world. And the second question is uh, very much thinking about the future and the field of the history of the book. What could book historians do in terms of methodology or an approach that has not been done yet? Well, as to the first question, um, to write a biography of the book, I actually use that word in describing a book I wrote about the Encyclopédie, which I called the biography of a book. What I attempted to do was to actually show how the book physically came into being. Uh, that meant tracing the paper that was uh, purchased for it, showing how the typesetters and the pressmen actually operated, um, tracing the production volume by volume, uh, then following their shipment in different routes and channels, uh, finding out about the total number of copies that existed, and finally uh, actually identifying the purchasers. Very tricky if you're going back 250 years in time, but I did come upon documentation that gave an, I think, adequate um, version of who actually bought the Encyclopédie which of course is the Bible of the Enlightenment, the most central work of the Enlightenment. What I could not do was to find out how they read it. So the history of reading, which is something that has obsessed me and friends of mine like Roger Chartier, is very, very difficult to reconstruct. We can take 
a few examples, but to have a, a, a rich and adequate account of the whole shape of the history of reading, I think, uh, has eluded us so far. Still, this was a biography of a book. And uh, I think that similar studies can be done. Of course, you need the documentation. History is always a matter of getting adequate evidence. But I am for dealing with each stage in the production and the diffusion, distribution of books into finally the actual reading of them in which you see how they become part of a reader's mental experience. Uh, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. Um, and I think that uh, that's what book historians are doing. I hope you're doing it in, in Brazil. But the second part of your question, could you repeat it, please? It had to do with the future of this kind of research. That's right. So before you go to the second part, I'd like to add some comments to the first part. Do you see any difference when we're talking about the biography of a book and bi the biography of a copy? So I'm talking about the, the copy that exists at the British Library or that exists at the Library of Sao Paulo anywhere, and the biography of a book as a very much broadened concept. So do you make any difference between those two aspects when writing and thinking about book production? Well, I do believe it's very important for the historian to actually touch copies and to look at them. Uh, in one case, I found a thumbprint inside a copy of the Encyclopédie. It was in, half of it was inside the binding. So it clearly was done by one of the pressmen. And I could find out which pressman printed that particular sheet of paper. His name, he had a nickname, Bunman, and I had some information about him, etc. So yes, I, th I think that individual copies are really very important, but that does not exclude the importance of a broader study, which is going to uh, trace the general pattern of diffusion of a book, and not simply um, of a particular edition, but to trace editions through time. Uh, that's something I did not do, but others have done uh, in wonderful studies of, um, for example, the, 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 the book called The Courtesan, uh, which uh, has been studied by Peter Burke, and he's shown how it's gone through different forms as it is republished, translated, absorbed into different literary traditions. Um, so what the courtesan as a kind of uh, important figure in Renaissance courts winds up being a kind of English gentleman uh, dressed in a dark suit with a dark necktie. Uh, and so texts, of course, have important biographies that move, so to speak, through time and that need to be traced. Well, I've, I've made this, this differentiation because I'm thinking about, for instance, the binding or the marginalia that belongs to a very specific copy. And yeah. uh, in my view, I think we can cross both things. So when you think about the, the copy that exists, we are talking about the life of that book in terms of reception and also in terms of reading and how it was commercialized within a community, not talking about the production itself. That's why I've moved to this differentiation um, um, between uh, producing a book in terms of copies and thinking about a specific copy that still exists. So Yeah, well, I agree, of course, that marginalia is very important. Mm. Uh, when I first w uh, was a student at Harvard University, I heard that students were allowed in the rare book library. And I also heard that the rare book library at Harvard had Herman Melville's copy of Emerson's essays. Well, I was a great lover of Herman Melville, Moby Dick, etc. So I took my courage in my hands and I went into the library and I said, could I see Melville's Emerson? And it appeared on the desk before me and there was Melville writing margin notes about Emerson's essays. Uh, 
it was fascinating because here is Melville with no formal education to speak of, a kind of quasi-working man, reading the great philosophy of this very esteemed figure, Emerson. There was one passage in which Emerson says, he's describing the world spirit as a transcendentalist. So a kind of idealist. The world spirit hovers over the entire globe, he says, even rough places like Cape Horn, where s sailors get through the rough water, but they're improved by the experience. And Melville puts a big X next to that passage. And at the bottom of the page puts an X and he says, to one who has sailed through Cape Horn as a common sailor, what stuff this is. It was a thrilling moment in which you could sort of read Emerson through the eyes of Melville. And I, I hope you've had such moments in your own research where you look at marginalia and you begin to see mental worlds colliding or intersecting. Yes, certainly I did, or something that has been crossed or whatever, so it's very important. Thank you. The second part was very much connected to the future of the history of the book. Do you see any challenge or what hasn't been done yet that, in your opinion, could be done or should be done, or it's a kind of wishful thinking, I would say? Uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm not very good at prophesying the past and prophesying the future is beyond me. So I have, I really don't know what, what's going to happen. Um, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm pondering what, uh, what I could possibly say. Um, hmm. I think that intertextuality is one great area to be developed. And we can do it better thanks to digital techniques. So books often contain passages from other books. And they could even be plagiarized, although the concept of plagiarism is a modern concept that certainly does not apply to Cervantes and Shakespeare and so on. Um, <clears throat> so I think that thanks to digital techniques, we can reconstruct exactly how elements from different books come together in one book and the way they come together. That I think would be actually fascinating. I did this once in a, at a very artisanal level in a book I wrote called The Devil in the Holy Water. Because I found that in one of the best-selling books from the 18th century called The Private Life of Louis XV, um, there were what were called anecdotes. They were little episodes, often one sentence or two sentences long. And as I read them, I thought, I've, I've read this somewhere else. And I began tracing little segments to different other books. And I was able to reconstruct in a few pages um, all of the sources of these fragments so that it turned out to my surprise that the key unit was the anecdote, not the whole text. And that anecdotes are like pieces in a mosaic that are being placed together and then sometimes taken out by another author for another book and placed there. Um, and if you look at the concept of the anecdote in, for example, the Encyclopédie, it's very different from the modern concept of anecdote, which is sort of casual gossip, probably not true. Uh, in the Encyclopédie, it's defined as secret history. It's something that really happened, but that is excluded from the formal authorized version of what happened. So anecdotal books, books that are mosaics of these tiny little fragments, had a kind of power, I believe, that uh, has escaped the modern reader. Uh, now, with digital capacity, you could trace sources systematically, and it would be interesting to see the way anecdotes are recycled from book to book, and therefore which ones are 
the most important and how maybe they resonated through amplification and repetition. That would be certainly fascinating. So thank you very much. All right, Mr. Lippi. Okay. Uh, I, I want to go back to sensors at work. Uh, 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 the subtitle is how states, uh, how states shape literature. And at some point, uh, you were discussing how the, the French censors in 18th century uh, 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 work as almost as literary critics. So how they are uh, not shaping the plan as the, they are not planning literature as the German, uh, uh, East German censors, but they are uh, 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 operating in terms of what should be good literature. Uh, uh, in this sense, uh, uh, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, uh, and, and also uh, uh, exploring some, some aspect of the idea of authorship that you uh, 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 mentioned in, in your, your previous response, uh, in which sense censorship is also an authorship. Uh, 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 in, in which sense censors are authors. I'm thinking here uh, in, in the system that we, uh, uh, when we are, uh, uh, we are uh, quoting, uh, 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 authors do not write books, they write text. Thanks. So also censors are authors in the sense. And I, I want to uh, uh, hear you about it and, and to explore this aspect of authorship, censorship, and the uh, uh, mingle in, in this two uh, 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 functions in, in, in 18th century and early modern times specifically. Right. Well, um, the phrase authors don't write books, they write texts comes from Donald Mackenzie, a bibliographer who was a good friend of mine. We taught a seminar together in Oxford, actually. Uh, and I think it's very true. So a book is the product of collective action. It's not simply the direct expression of an author. And I think Mackenzie has demonstrated this in his own scholarship. Um, and now, uh, in reading the manuscripts concerning French censors, I was at first quite amazed. So these are, these are memos or letters they write to one another, not for, pub, for the public. And they say very extraordinary things. They will say, we should not publish this book. Its style is miserable. This book, it's not a book at all. The author starts in one direction, then he comes back, goes in another. He, it doesn't hang together. It should not be given permission. Um, never do they say this book, this text violates morality, religion, the interests of the state. That simply does not come up. It's all about the quality of the manuscripts. And indeed, in some of their letters, they say, well, you know, I actually met with the author and explained to him the problems in his work. Uh, they weren't supposed to do that, but they did. And the censors were men of letters like the authors. They knew one another frequently. So yes, there is a process of complicity. And you could definitely say that the censors are partial authors. They belong to the process of book production. And uh, I would not object at all if you say, OK, they are. there are many authors of a book. Even, Mackenzie would add, uh, the people who design the, comp the composition of it, because that affects its meaning. Um, now, having said that, it sounds too good, too innocent. Everyone uh, used to insist that the Enlightenment is a struggle for freedom of speech against oppression. That's not wrong. Because, of course, anyone who had written a book that challenged the church or the king or morality would not submit it to the censors. There was no way it would get approval. You sent it to Amsterdam or Geneva or Neuchâtel. And then it was printed, published, 
smuggled into France. Often it was very widely read and the police would raid bookstores. Uh, the customs officials would try to capture the shipments as they entered into France and circulated, etc. So yes, there was post-publication censorship in the form of police action. The authors were often sent to the Bastille and not just the authors, but the booksellers. Uh, there's more Im uh, imprisonment of booksellers than writers. So it was a complex system that was indeed repressive. But my point was that throughout this, there's a process of complicity, of compromise. People understand what the other roles are. And you have to uh, interpret it, I think, in the context of a 18th century society where privilege is, I think, the central idea. Privilege from the Latin for private law. You could, if you had a privilege to do something that other people couldn't do, and that books had privileges. So um, that's what censors did. They gave approbations that made a privilege possible. The privilege was given by the king, the keeper of the seals. Um, so in other words, books, I think, fit into the overall context of the nature of society under the old regime where privilege is central. Now in Germany, it's a different system, but there too, there was a lot of complicity between the censors and the authors. And one thing that surprised me, I hadn't known this, was that in Germany, unlike France or your country today, if you wrote a book, you never submitted the entire, or virtually never submitted the entire text to a publisher. You talked it over with an editor. The editor was actually a censor. He was a member of the Communist Party. He gave you clearance for the very idea of the book before it got into the plan that I mentioned. And often writers uh, negotiated with their editors paragraph by paragraph, certainly chapter by chapter, so that the editor, editor is really a co-author of the book. There the complicity and the compromises were extensive, and it was possible, not just in my interview with the censors, but it, when I went to the papers of the Communist Party to actually reconstruct that. I mean, it was amazing. I could take authors and follow every stage of their negotiations, first with the editors, then with the censors, and then sometimes with higher ups in the Communist Party. A complex process, but one that permeated literature as it really was produced and experienced. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Jonathan. Okay, so Veronica, please. Well, my question is a little bit long, but <laughs> it's, it's kind of simple, but I think it needs context maybe for the people that are going to see this video. So um, in 1982, you published uh, an essay entitled, What is the History of Books? So you were trying to define the discipline and you also suggested, and I quote you, a general model for analyzing the way books come into being and spread through society. You designed a diagram of the communications circuit from the author to the reader and uh, passing through other processes and people. In 2007, you were invited to review this essay and you commented on the criticism you received, especially uh, the essay by Adams and Barker that uh, provided another perspective of your diagram. And well, after all of this debate, you publish many other essays and books where this design of the diagram maybe was absent, not in not every occasion you printed a, a diagram, but a sense of the communication circuit is still evoked. So networks and connections between the book trade and the society in general are mentioned and analyzed in order to explain the transmission uh, of ideas and texts. So after 
your recent discussions of networks, orality, music, and different forms of transmission of information and sharing uh, forms of sharing information, uh, how would you reevaluate your diagram or your idea of a communication circuit? Uh, well, you know, every once in a while, someone sends me their own version of my diagram. I've got a little collection, you know, with circles and boxes and so on. So I think, I hope that it accomplished what it set out to do, not to give a sort of firm model that people should conform to, but rather to stimulate ways of thinking about connections. So the central point I wanted to make in 1982 was that people were working on aspects of book history that were not connected, that you became an expert on uh, maybe uh, watermarks or an expert on authorship. But books history, I think, needs to bring them all together. Um, and so I, you know, it's, uh, I, I see the essay cited fairly often, and I get these substitute diagrams. And the one by Nicholas Barker, who's a friend of mine, uh, I like very much because uh, it, it brought out something that was missing in my own work, namely the time dimension, how books um, are transformed as they are re-edited, sent to libraries, and used over generations. So I thought that was an excellent criticism. Um, I didn't agree, however, with the, the argument that my version of the history of books concentrated too much on people. Uh, when the criticism was, you know, I talk about publishers and authors and booksellers and wagon drivers and uh, censors or whatever, uh, but what about the book itself? I don't accept that. I understand where the criticism came from because these are people trained in the tradition, especially of Anglo-Saxon bibliography, that want to eliminate all that text contextual information and see a new integrity in the study of the actual physical object. So I sympathize with that. As I said, I've worked a lot with John McKenzie and I understand that point of view. And yet it seems to me that all history is about people. And you need to know how people intervened in the general process that ended up with this printed object. So I'm not denying the importance of the object itself, but I think we need to understand the people who brought it into being. And I, almost everything I write, and I think maybe what you write as well, has to do with people, people doing things. Uh, and what I was saying earlier about the importance of meaning is, well, we're trying to get at what is meaningful in history, and that is how people deal with things. They express ideas through their actions, through their writing, through, through, through everything they do. Um, so uh, although I accept the criticism that we need a time dimension and more library history in the history of books, I don't accept the view that we simply should isolate the text itself, um, uh, including its um, uh, transformation through different editions. I don't accept that as adequate to understanding book history. Thank you. And uh, concerning this um, sense of the communication circuit, now that you have been dealing with other types of uh, communications, such as music and poetry and the police, which is brilliant, uh, how would you think about all of these other um, media that are all uh, that are also related to the transmission of ideas that are within the book? So we're not just talking about the book itself right now, but the communication in a broader sense. Yes. Well, I don't think I could come up with a diagram. I think it's too complicated. But if I could go back to the example I cited earlier about the concept of an anecdote. It seems to me you can follow an anecdote as it's expressed orally 
maybe according to a police spy or someone who's written a journal. And the way it's then uh, takes form as a manuscript note, how it appears in a printed book and how it moves from one printed book to another, like a piece in a mosaic. Um, I think, you know, one could be, in other words, systematic in the study. Now, whether, you know, I could come up with a model to do that, I don't know. Maybe you could. It's a good idea if you're interested in that sort of thing. Give it a try. I think models are, are helpful. So I, please. <laughs> I'll submit my model to you then <laughs> later. <laughs> but um, for example, the theater is, is fascinating because in the theater, you're dealing with oral communication, but usually from a printed script. And yet that script evolves and the actors themselves intervene. Each performance is different. And as Roger Chartier has said in his studies of Moliere, you know, a performance at the court is very different from a performance in the middle of Paris. Um, Alvin Kernan is a wonderful historian of the Shakespearean um, theater. And he makes that point very effectively in a study of Shakespeare as a court poet because uh, Shakespeare's troupe, the King's Players, performed before the court. And that performance was actually very different from what they did in this rather wild world in the outskirts of London, where you had bear baiting and whorehouses and pubs and theater, all as a part of the uh, it's, it was called the Liberties of London as a, a, liber a free area in which a tremendous amount of cultural activity was possible. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if you, there would be a diagram to show that, but certainly uh, you could have the same play, um, A Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, communicating a very different kind of message or complex of messages according to the actual occasion and setting. Thank you, Professor. Well, actually, uh, we have got time for one more question. So the fastest interviewer can start it. I think I can oh, make, uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Andrea. Okay. Um, so I, I try to make it short because you've already mentioned um, your engagement with the project with the Digital Public Library of America, which comes back to the time that you are a librarian director in Harvard, and it's very much connected to your engagement against Google Monopoly, which leads to the publication of the case for Box. And I visited the homepage of the Digital Public Library of America two days ago, and I was very much fascinated because I've seen an exhibition in this um, homepage, which is called America During the 1918 Influenza Pandemic. And for my surprise, this exhibition dates back to 2015. I, I thought it was something that was done for the dates that we are experiencing now. And I would like to um, call attention from everybody to this exhibition and especially to the section called The Legacy of the Pandemic, which is quite afraid, something that would frighten everybody because it shows that the disease itself was so virulent that it continued to mutate and resist eradication. So uh, it's what we see at the internet. And I'd like to take this opportunity to ask you, um, how do you evaluate this project today, the Digital Public Library of America? And if you see any kind of the legacy of the pandemic 2020 for the libraries in the future and the way that people communicate or uh, exchange information? Well, I should explain first that although I was part of the creation of the Digital Public Library of America, it began at a conference that I called at Harvard, um, uh, so it began from nothing, so to speak, uh, and since has grown, um, I no longer uh, am on the board. We have a rotating system. So all of us who were involved in its creation have now rotated off, and it's in new hands. It's, I think, uh, 
a great success. It has it makes available about 30 million volumes free of charge to everyone. And it has special exhibits such as the one you mentioned. In fact, it does many other things. Um, there's something called Simply E, which was developed by the New York Public Library, a marvelous program that makes uh, it possible for public libraries scattered all over the country to have access to digitized forms of books in a very efficient way. And so the whole process of distribution digitally has been simplified and democratized. I mean, that would be, I think, the main direction that uh, the Digital Public Library of America has taken. Another one is educational. Uh, when we first thought of it, um, I must admit, I thought of it as a collection of the great research libraries that would serve scholars. So now a scholar would not have to go into her or his own library, you could have immediate access to all of the great research collections. But um, since then, the emphasis has shifted from research and scholarship to general books and the general public. And the key players, I think, in the DPLA, as we call it, are public librarians. Now, I know you have public librarians in Brazil and uh, certainly in the US, they are a key ingredient in, in, in the life of society, in small towns, in neighborhoods of cities. That's where people go for information. Um, and that includes a lot of people who are not legally in the U.S. If you are an immigrant from Mexico um, and you want to get a driver's license, you don't go to the police department to ask how to do it. You go to the public library where someone will speak to you in Spanish and help you uh, get your public license. Or in fact, if you're unemployed, that librarian will help you find a job online because you don't have a computer and don't know how to use a computer. So what is happening, I think, is that the Digital Public Library of America is part of a process of opening up information, of democratizing access to information and providing a whole variety of services. But I'm delighted that you found the exhibition on the uh, epidemic important. So you see, there's an effort to speak to needs today and not simply to make things available. I think the DPLA should not, should be proactive, should not simply make things available online and wait for the public to come, but rather should go out and meet the public and be in dialogue with the public and get the public to participate in the basic process of cultural experience. Fantastic. That's it. I agree with you. Thank you. Well, thank you. All right, uh, Veronica, you have one more question, right? Yeah, uh, actually, just because of the time, I know that we have to uh, finish the interview, but there is a question that we are uh, asking to everybody that we have the opportunity to talk with, which is this, uh, this situation that we are living in the hum humanities and especially in the history field, that we are dealing a lot with a kind of revisionism or negationism from other people and from people that are not from our field. They are discrediting our work or sometimes putting doubts or denying events such as the Holocaust that we, we thought that we are not having to deal with this anymore in 2020, but we are dealing with things like that. Uh, I think that especially here in Brazil and also in the USA. So uh, I would like to ask you, what do you think about this movement of uh, this kind of uh, denial of history. What do you think about that? Well, I'm uh, tempted to heave a great sigh. Huh. Uh, it's, uh, it makes one feel sad and uh, it is a threat to the very thing to which we're most committed, which is trying to understand the past, the present, to understand the human condition. 
I think history is about that, understanding the human condition, how people made meaning out of their life, to find meaning by actually consulting other forms of meaningfulness in the past and in other places. Um, if we don't do that, I think our lives are reduced to a kind of two-dimensional existence without the dimension of the past. I see that as a danger, especially in the USA, where the understanding of history is inadequate. It's not well taught in uh, secondary schools. Uh, the interest of undergraduates in history has gone down. Um, the shift towards technical subjects has displaced the general understanding of the humanities and the social sciences. Um, aside from this sense of, um, you know, the post-factual world in which you've got alternative facts. I'm quoting now from the Trump administration. I'm sure you've heard the expression alternative facts as if a fact itself uh, it could not exist or could just exist the way you want it to exist. No, I don't have a simple-minded, positivistic notion of fact, but I do have a strong feeling about evidence. It seems to me history is an argument built on evidence, and people can look at the evidence and challenge your interpretation, as they've done in reading my work, as you are doing now. So um, without that more rigorous sense of uh, evidence and argument and um, facts in a broader sense, culture is impoverished. Uh, it's easy to condemn mindlessness and uh, what goes by the name of populism. But at times of suffering, uh, do you think people will actually deny suffering itself? If you're struck by the pandemic or if you lose a, a relative or a friend, are you going to say, well, this was a an alternative fact, this death? Uh, I th it seems to me that we are forced by events such as the Holocaust to take seriously suffering as an ingredient of the human condition. <coughs> so uh, I, much as I regret the current uh, disengagement from rigor and fact and, and evidence and argument. Uh, uh, I remain optimistic in the sense that people, when confronted with something as terrible as the pandemic, are going to need to make sense of it. And the making sense of something is such a fundamental activity that I don't see it disappearing in a kind of vague fog of uh, alternative facts and sheer populist rhetoric. I don't think that can happen. It can happen for a while, but, uh, you know, I think of Lincoln's famous remark, you can fool some of the people some of the time, all of the people, some, but some of the time, but not all of the people all of the time. And I, I believe, I sense, I could be wrong, that certainly in the United States, we're, we are moving away from this notion of alternative facts, post-truth, and general uh, nonsense. Uh, but I think it's our responsibility as uh, intellectuals to become engaged in this effort to expose the fatuousness of that kind of view. Yeah, I think we all agree with that. Thank you. Well, Professor, I, I really hope that you have enjoyed it as much as we did. <laughs> I have indeed, and I love, uh, I love to exchange remarks like this. I thank you for very good questions, and I especially want to express my sympathy and solidarity with Brazilians. Uh, I love Brazil, and uh, if I had another life, I would be speaking with you in Portuguese, as I should but it's a little late for me to pick that up. Uh, and so I can only say that I sympathize deeply with what you're going through and thank you for the contact we've been able to make. All right, we hope, we hope you have another life for this extra conversation. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, então, eu agradeço vocês que assistiram até aqui uh, essa, nossa, essa nossa entrevista. Agradecemos a sua audiência e até o, o, o próximo Interlocuções.